Dr. Joseph Mihark, uh, Chief of Pulmonary and Critical Care, Roger Williams, and Director of the Pulmonary Fellowship here. We're uh, very excited about our new associate, Dr. Rabi El Bizri, who brings to Roger Williams a uh, talent in interventional pulmonary that he acquired uh, during several months of training in Boston. Dr. El Bizri has done uh, more than 60 EBIS procedures, and we have, uh, for the last two months, been doing EBIS uh, here, both in the endoscopy suite and for more complicated cases in the operating room. <coughs> EBIS is a, uh, an interesting procedure. Essentially, it's a, an ultrasound probe at the end of a bronchoscope. And what it gives us the ability to do is to look on the other side of the bronchial wall. And there we can find uh, things like the azagus, vein, and the pulmonary artery, and sometimes right in between them is a worrisome node, which we can then accurately send a 21 or 22 gauge needle into and aspirate uh, whatever cells may be in that node, hopefully making a diagnosis of granulomatous disease, but unfortunately sometimes uh, lung cancer or lymphoma. What EBIS allows us to do is to uh, stage patients who have a diagnosis of lung cancer already. Uh, we can access uh, uh, all of the uh, nodal stations on uh, abutting the main stem airways, the trachea, uh, out to a subsegmental level. And <clears throat> may effectively do away with uh, most um, metastinoscopies, which of course require general anesthesia and are, are more invasive than uh, uh, the EBIS evaluation of the nodal stations. Uh, something else we're uh, trained in currently, and, and Dr. L. Bisri will be doing uh, uh, more sojourns to uh, Boston and perhaps St. Louis, is the use of a radial ultrasound probe. This is called radial ebus. With this, you can approach peripheral lesions. Uh, currently, with a peripheral lesion, we would go to a CAT scan guided needle aspiration, which yeah. has an incidence of uh, bronchopleural fistula. And the problem with these bronchopleural fistulas is that uh, uh, they can take a week, uh, a, a week or more to clear up and you might require tube thoracostomy during that time. Um, but with radial ebus, we can get to the peripheral lesion uh, with the ultrasound. We, we put the bronchoscope out into the uh, segmental or subsegmental airway, hopefully, that we think is leading to the lesion. And then we put a sheath through that, and then through the sheath is a very tiny uh, ultrasound probe. Uh, it's, uh, it's about two millimeters in uh, diameter. And that probe gives us a 360-degree image of the tissues around the airway. And with it, people who have uh, 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 trained in radial ebus can find a peripheral lesion in anywhere from 15 minutes to half an hour. Um, there's another way to get to peripheral lesions, which is navigational bronchoscopy. And the literature and, and people's experience that I've talked to suggests that it can take uh, probably on average about an hour uh, to find the lesion, if not uh, a little more. And then when you actually sample the lesion, you're not doing it under direct visualization. You're doing it based on a computer-generated map, uh, which is fine, but the uh, sensitivity of this biopsy technique is somewhere on the order of 60 to 80 percent, where radial ebus is getting uh, a sensitivity of 80 to 90 percent in the hands of those who are currently uh, participating in this procedure. So uh, it, it looks like with radial ebus we can get to the lesion quicker and we can more accurately biopsy it using radial ebus as opposed to navigational bronchoscopy and that's what we're pursuing currently. Something else we're uh, uh, looking into in our uh, nascent department of interventional pulmonary is called bronchial thermoplasty. A bronchial thermoplasty uh, uses a catheter 
and insert it through the bronchoscope to apply uh, heat, uh, radio frequency heat, to the segmental and larger airways. <clears throat> and what typically happens is uh, it's a three-step procedure, and <clears throat> you heat up the airways of the uh, of the right lower lobe, and then three weeks later you do the left lower lobe, and then three weeks later you do both upper lobes together. <clears throat> the result of this procedure was. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, it's, it's roughly a 60% reduction in anything bad. 60% uh, reduction in acute exacerbations, hospital admissions, trips to the ER, uh, roughly a 60% reduction in days lost from school or, or work. And this data was confirmed at both two years and just recently, a uh, five-year data analysis of that group shows that these benefits persist. How does it work? Well, we don't really know. Uh, under a microscope uh, tissue, you find that after radiofrequency ablation, <clears throat> the smooth muscle layer uh, of the uh, major airways is uh, thinned by about 80%. Uh, is this the main <clears throat> uh, avenue by which bronchial thermoplasty re <clears throat> reduces the incidence of uh, adverse effects of your asthma? <clears throat> we don't know. All we really know is that at this time is that <clears throat> five years out, there was uh, no, in, no incidence of uh, untoward side effects such as permanent scarring of the airway, and the benefits in terms of asthma control uh, <clears throat> persisted for five years. Currently, bronchial thermoplasty is indicated for people with severe asthma, people who are having many, uh, many exacerbations a year, uh, asthma that's interrupting their uh, uh, function during the day and their sleep at night, asthma is causing uh, several hospital admissions a year. So <clears throat> we, uh, we are on the cusp of purchasing this unit and uh, we've already been away to get some uh, uh, training uh, at Yale.